Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Chow, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this uh, panel discussion on commercializing technology. We're really going to focus on commercializing scientific discoveries and technologies that uh, have been developed within a university environment. Uh, I want to begin by thanking our three sponsors, uh, first the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. This is a special center within the engineering school here at Princeton University that not only focuses on innovation in the curriculum, but also on new kinds of activities that enable students to take what they've learned and apply it uh, to the world. Uh, our second uh, co-sponsor is Jumpstart New Jersey. This is a, a, a very uh, effective and, and, and wonderful group of individual investors, what we call angel investors, who work together, uh, although they make their decisions independently, and uh, invest in pre-seed and, and seed uh, investments, as well as in some cases later stage investments. But they represent here in this state a very important uh, a source of capital for entrepreneurs and new enterprises. And our third uh, co-sponsor, is the law firm of uh, Drinker, Biddle, and, and Reese. And this is a, a firm that's a, a very large firm, but it operates as an entrepreneurial venture, at least from my eyes. And they work with a lot of the small companies, the startup uh, companies. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of the three co-sponsors uh, for this. We might say, well, what are they sponsoring? Well, after our session, there's going to be a reception, uh, and I hope you'll be able to stay for that and get to know uh, one another. One of the greatest opportunities for changing the world for the better is the collection of scientific discoveries and technological innovations that uh, have been made within the university environment. And yet, this opportunity is often underutilized. The focus of our conversation this afternoon is to describe the process by which technologies that have been developed within the university environment, in the laboratories, uh, uh, by uh, researchers at colleges and universities, the process of taking them out of the laboratory and making them real uh, through commercialization activities in the form of products or services, often within new enterprises. We have a lineup of panelists that can describe this process and, and also to help us understand how to make it better through the perspectives of the various participants in the process. Uh, we have um, a professor, Vivek Pai, who uh, is associate professor in the computer science department, who will be able to help us understand through the eyes of a faculty member and someone who's conducting research how that research can be better commercialized. Uh, we have, uh, in addition, a representative of the, of the uh, Princeton uh, Technology Transfer uh, Office, and um, uh, that's um, uh, Lori Zodikoff. Uh, she, um, her job is to not only encourage uh, faculty members and researchers to um, um, file disclosures of, about inventions they've made, but also to market those inventions, that is to be the intermediary between the inventors and the people who may uh, use them. Uh, our third uh, panelist is uh, Tom McWilliams. 
and he's with the Drinker Biddle uh, Law Firm, and he'll be talking about the intellectual property aspects of uh, this process of technology commercialization, as well as uh, other uh, legal matters that uh, might uh, be involved. Uh, Catherine O'Neill is a representative of the uh, Jumpstart New Jersey network, and, and she'll be talking about the process through the eyes of the uh, investors that supply the capital that's so essential to this process. And finally, we have Sharam uh, Hazaki, who is, um, no, I said that wrong, didn't I? Haz Hazaki, Hazazi, <laughs> who, who is uh, a, a venture capital investor uh, and his firm focuses on life sciences, and in particular at pre-seed and, and seed levels. So plays a very important part in uh, uh, helping to take technologies from the laboratory into the real world. The format of our panel is that each of these five panelists will present their ideas and offer their advice and guidance on this process in a five to seven minute presentations. And then when those presentations are concluded, uh, we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask your questions to all of the panelists or any one of them. So I'll start with uh, you, Vic. So, okay, so I'm going to be giving a, uh, a brief talk about what I've seen from the uh, perspective as, of a, uh, a grad student who had a startup and as a professor who's had a startup, right? And I should say that uh, you know, most of this is software uh, specific, right? So my background is mostly in high performance uh, networking software. And the, the history here is that uh, you know, right out of grad school, and before I joined Princeton, uh, I, I was actually scheduled to join Princeton. I took a, you know, a one semester delay. I said, oh, you know, the thesis isn't written yet. Um, yeah, I'd accepted the offer, so yeah, it was already cemented here. Uh, we, we did our first startup. Uh, it was uh, called IMIC Networking. Uh, you know, a couple years later, it was acquired by a company called Ironport. Uh, I then joined the product advisory board at Ironport, uh, which was acquired by Cisco for a lot more money than we were ever acquired for. Uh, I think uh, the Cisco acquisition was about $900 million. Uh, and then uh, after I finally got disentangled from all the non-competes and stuff, uh, we started up a new startup here um, at Princeton called Coblitz, which is focusing on the uh, content distribution market. And so the, the caveats here is that pretty much everything we talk about is software. So it might be a, a fairly narrow scope that you know, what I say here may not apply to bio, which is a completely different field for spin-outs. Right, so the university provides a pretty nice pathway to turn research into products. Right? So you know, one of the things that you, know, you, you sort of take for granted here is that you get excellent colleagues. Right? So the, the co-founders of our startup are all from the university. Uh, you know, Larry Peterson is a professor and chair. Uh, and head of the uh, Planet Lab project, which is this global test web that we sort of spun out from. Uh, my grad student, Kyung Soo Park, and so our startup was his PhD, right? So there's, there's this trend of, you know, the, the, the grad student you know, finishes up a PhD and then you can, you know, commercialize that. Uh, Mark Fizinski, a research scientist, and Patrick Richardson, who's an undergrad who took uh, Professor Zhao's class, and that's how he sort of goaded all of us into actually doing the startup. Right? Uh, so the research can actually take you pretty far, especially if you can use the tools around you. And you know, the contacts you make in the R&D world can provide some level of vetting for your company when companies talk to you. you know, if their own researchers say, oh, yeah, you know, these guys are solid. We know them. We know their history. Right? But the research model is also slightly broken uh, from the standpoint of it's not a direct you know, uh, research, you know, advanced R&D product pathway. Right? And so, uh, especially if you wait on uh, publications, this just slows down the process, right? But uh, this is, you know, sometimes a good thing, right? But, you know, in our own experience, it took us forever to get published. And, in fact, most of the work on the startup was actually unfunded. But, you know, stuff we were doing in our spare time because the funding agencies didn't consider it that interesting, right? So, uh, but even if you have trend, uh, funding, you know, transition <laughs> can still be a problem because all the stuff that turns a research idea into a product that average people can use, you know, all the documentation, all the polish and stuff, 
you can't really do that in a university environment. All right, and so uh, the other thing I learned was that timing was everything, right? So when I was in grad school in you know, 98, everybody was funding proxy startups. There were about 20 proxy startups that were out there, and I think two broke even. Uh, we right after grad school, everybody said, oh, well, storage is the money where, you know, storage is where the money is. So there are 20 storage startups, and again, two broke even. And then about 2004, there are about, you know, 20 CDN startups, right? And so, and, and the, the problem here is that, you know, it's not rational, right? So that, you know, money losers will be acquired if, they're, if they have the largest market share, right? So, you know, think of YouTube. They had no, no real business plan. They're bleeding money fast. They were the ones who got acquired, right? Uh, and, and the problem is that all the carcasses that, that start dying can still be acquired for their technology, right? So, you know, e even if you think like, ah, you know, I need to make money, I need to have this, you know, this great business plan, you know, if, if you don't get the timing right, it, it may or may not happen. Um, and so the, the observation I have is that, you know, if you decide earlier, like, you know, if, if we, as soon as we had this idea, if we'd just gone out there and done, done a startup, you know, we would have had, you know, probably a four-year advantage on most of our competitors. Flip side is that Kyungsoo wouldn't have gotten his PhD and I wouldn't have gotten tenure. So, you know, there's some trade-offs there, right? Uh, you know, what are you doing it for? Right, so the, the observation here is that, you know, uh, there's always this cliche that it's always about the team, right? And usually for small startups, it is the people that somebody acquires, right? It's, it's never the code because, you know, you can rewrite the code and if you get the code without the people, nobody's gonna understand it anyway, right? And so, uh, you know, get all the right people together, uh, get a good lawyer, a good advisor, you know, whatever you can. You know, back in the old days, the lawyers used to work for equity uh, and then they learned their lesson. So now it actually costs money. Um, yeah, but the, the, the flip side is that universities are also pretty good about understanding that, you know, especially for software startups, you know, let them go out, let them make their money, you know, then they'll be friends with the university as opposed to, you know, back in 2000 it was, you know, oh my God, you can never let the people go, you know, you have to, you know, put all this licensing restrictions on them. You know, now the university is much more friendlier about this. Right, but if you do this, you know, be prepared to have it consume all of your free time, right? So when you're watching a movie, you're, you're thinking, yeah, should I be watching the rest of this movie or should I be you know, adding the next feature to the code, right? Because if, if you're not in that mentality and if you really don't want to give up all your free time, you know, maybe you can just license your software, right? You, know, you, you get some stake in the upside, you, know, you do some consulting, uh, you, you get some tech transfer out of it. And then finally, you know, in, in the 10 seconds I have left, uh, you know, my best advice for you, you know, ask around. There are a lot of people who have done this uh, sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't, and most of them will give you advice for free, right? And that's, that's usually your constraint uh, when you start up. So, you know, you decide to go this route, good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Lori? Hi, I, I don't have slides, so I think I'll just stay put here, but I wanted to start off and thank our sponsors and Ed for putting together the panel and also uh, start out and giving you a little bit about our office, a little bit of our statistics and then go into the process and then talk about some of the issues and challenges that we face as a, an office of uh, technology licensing. Uh, first of all, our office is uh, located in New South, which is right next to the Dinky Station. And one thing that you'll hear me say and say again during my presentation is we really feel that tech transfer is a contact sport. So we want people to come and visit us and we will go out and visit you as well. Um, our office is quite small. In addition to myself, we have, I have one other licensing colleague who, as Ed said, is responsible for going out and making contacts with industry and VCs and entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a director who's John Ritter, who most of you probably know. We have an administrative assistant who does a lot of, uh, who's responsible for a lot of our, our obligations. As you know, uh, we're mandated by Baidol to report all federally funded inventions to the government, and she takes care of that. It's a lot of work. And most likely, if you send us a disclosure form, you'll be, she'll be in contact with you for information and to make sure that our records are, are, are correct. We also have a finance manager by the name of Tom Voitsberger, and Tom takes care of all of our financial matters, but most important is he's in charge of revenue distributions to our faculty inventors. Um, so we're quite small, but we, um, we, we do a lot. And in addition to the commercialization process, which I'll get into, we do a lot of things that are related and very important to that process, such as material transfer agreements, confidentiality agreements, sponsored research agreements. And we work with a lot of our supporting offices, uh, like the Office of Research and Project Administration, who 
negotiate a lot of the sponsored contracts, research agreements that we get, but sometimes we'll join in with them and help them with the IP clauses as well. Um, we work very, we're, our office reports to the Dean for Research, who is Stu Smith, so we work closely with our colleagues in um, uh, corporate foundation relations and the Dean for Research in reaching out to industry contacts, so we're really a concerted focus effort there. Um, as far as the office goes, we get about 80 to 100 invention disclosures a year. We file about 60 provisional patents, and about half of those we turn over to non-provisional patents. We have, um, or patent applications, we have 32, about on average, 32 patents issued each year. And remember, there's a time lag between when something is filed and when it's issued. Usually, it can be many years. Um, we do about 15 to 20 agreements uh, per year, license agreement, options agreements, and we help um, the with the start with startups. You know, maybe two to three a year, and continue to support those as needed. And again, I mentioned those ancillary agreements, which are, again, an important part to the commercialization process, material transfer agreements and confidentialities. We probably do 100 of each each year. So there's a lot of, a lot of coming and going in our office. Um, some of the products that um, you may know about that really are being sold that have come through the university commercialization process is Alimta, which is a cancer drug sold by Eli Lilly, which is out of our Department of Chemistry. Um, there's the, Tiger Optics is a company that sells uh, uh, mon uh, detection equipment for trace gas analysis. You may be familiar with Universal Display Corporation, which licenses OLED technology to, to other industries. And then we have uh, we sell mice models through a vendor called Taconic Artemis. So there's just several several examples of products that um, are being commercialized through the office and through our efforts. As far as the process goes, it usually starts with the disclosure form, and some of you may or may not be familiar with this, but it's available on our website, and I'd be happy to send you one if you give me your card. And a lot of times the process starts with a phone call to our office through, from a faculty or a graduate student, and we start the process from there. But the disclosure form is very important to our process, because once we get the disclosure form, we do a, an assessment of the patentability and the commercial viability of the technology. So we ask a lot of questions about what is the invention, who are the inventors, are there any co-inventing institutions, um, what, what's the experimental data that's available, were there other materials from another institution used in the creation of the invention, uh, what, what are, what's the novelty, the utility, what are the limitations of the technology. Once we get that form, and also it's very important, the sponsor of the technology is listed because again, we, we, have, we are obligated by the federal government to report those inventions back to the federal government. But we go through that form and then Princeton's very, our office I think is quite unique in this area in that we try to meet one-on-one -on -one, or we do meet one-on-one -on -one with all of our faculty or students. So we go out and we meet with them and really under, try to understand the invention and more importantly, their needs and interests in taking the technology from the from the lab to the marketplace because they may have their own ideas, which you know we want to keep their needs in mind um, as as well. And and I think there's a very important statistic that I've learned and that I like to share with you that most of our best licensing contacts come from the faculties uh, faculty members and their and the inventors or the uh, the graduate students because they're out in technical meetings, they have contacts through their own network. And a lot of times they're, they've been talking to those people about their inventions. And it's very important when we have our discussions regarding the disclosure form that those are shared with us because we know our faculty are very busy and they might not have the time to reach out to those contacts, but that's what our office is, is here to do. Um, so that the once we go through the disclosure process, um, we, we sort of do our due diligence and that's a variety of different different activities that our office goes through, uh, we'll, we'll reach out to our industry contacts or our colleagues in other universities and, and do our marketing. We'll, we, we prepare a non-confidential brief that describes the technology um, very succinctly, and we send that to our corporate contacts. We have a huge database of, of industry contacts that we reach out to, and it's really an iterative process where we send the the information out and we have dialogue, we get feedback from people, we ask for feedback, we go to people like Catherine and Sharon and, and look for their feedback 
and and you know discuss that with the inventor and and um, not not all the time do we look for a licensee for a technology sometimes a sponsored research collaboration or an option to a technology is 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 our goal um, and it's important to realize that it's not a one size fit all because every technology is different it fits a different industry it's at a different stage we don't have a cookie cutter approach so it's really a very hands-on approach um, one very important part of the um, disclosure process is you know, is there immediate need to do, do something like file a patent or a provisional patent? And maybe as uh, my colleague here will explain about the publication, I think you may be familiar that if you, if you make a publication or a presentation, you have a year within the U.S. to file for patent protection. But in the rest of the world, that's, that's not true. You lose that, that right. So when we review the disclosure form, we're very careful about making sure that everyone is aware of that, that those facts. And not every technology that we get is appropriate for filing a patent on, and we, we make those decisions as well. But as we go through our marketing process, we make those decisions whether to file a patent or not. Sometimes we have to prior to making those decisions. But as, as far as some of the, the process issues that I wanted to talk about, I think what's important to us in the success of uh, successful commercialization of our technologies is to really have a partnership with the PI or the inventor that's involved. Um, we need his or her help, and in, in, they're the expert in the technology. When we go out and market the technology, we have, we have conference calls um, with our potential licensees. If we file a patent, there's a lot of work to be done on filing that patent. Not that we're drafting the patent or we expect the faculty member to draft the patent, but we'll have a patent attorney draft those patents. And there's a lot, it's an iterative process as well. And then, sub, and then with time, within time, we get office actions. And it's very important to, to partner with the PI and, and have a, a good relationship established. And I think a lot of the success is just being very persistent and always trying to reach out to people who can help us get to the next step in a technology. Um, some of the challenges is really um, the early stage in, of our technology in developing that proof of concept. And we do use, we do leverage a lot of um, uh, initiatives that are out there and available to us. We were getting funding from the New, Jer New Jersey Sci Commission of Science and Technology at one time. Um, companies, particularly big pharmaceutical companies, have projects in early stage technology. We reach out to, to them. They try to, you know, if they're interested, they'll invest to bring it to a certain, certain stage. So even though we, it's a challenge, um, we have found ways to move our technologies forward. We also can leverage um, some government programs. There's a, a program with the NCI and the Nano uh, Technology Characterization Lab, where some of our licensees have been very successful in uh, proposing and getting money to move uh, technologies through the stages, various stages of development. Um, I think in the economic downturn that we're all in, it's it's harder to get investors interested in earlier stage technologies. Everyone's moved up to a less risky um, situation, and and our our. Time frame to commercialization is very long, particularly for the life sciences. Uh, to give you an example, uh, we signed, well, we didn't, no one in our office signed a license for Olympta. That was done in 1985, and revenues uh, were started to generate in 2004. So it's a long time, and sometimes we, we understand we need to be patient um, in, in our process. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Tom, uh, what are the, the uh, legal issues associated with this process? Thank you. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors and uh, thank the university for having me. Uh, I am a patent attorney. Uh, I've been a patent attorney for about 13 years. Um, before that, I was an engineer. And uh, I often say I became a patent attorney because I realized I wasn't nearly smart enough to be an engineer. <laughs> so I'm better suited listening to other people's inventions than trying to invent things myself. Uh, but my practice, uh, I'm exposed on what I'll, I'll state as all the different sides of the equation in commercializing university technologies. Uh, and by that I mean 
we represent universities. Uh, we work directly with inventors uh, who do the inventing at the universities. Uh, we work with uh, offices of tech transfer and technology licensing. Uh, we also work with small companies who do things like uh, STTRs and uh, SBIRs and work with university technologies. We work with big companies. Uh, a lot of them have uh, venture arms, uh, for example. Uh, others have uh, joint venture arms wherein they want to participate in university technologies. Uh, and we work with investment groups that, uh, that come to the universities. Uh, sometimes the universities approach them with technologies. Sometimes they come to the universities uh, looking for technologies that may uh, fit certain puzzle pieces that I'll, I'll explain in a moment. But uh, the, the way I'd like to talk about the intellectual property issues that come up with regard to commercializing university technologies is sort of divide this into three buckets. Uh, the way uh, I envision it in my practice, you've got your inventors. Uh, they're obviously the key because they're the ones coming up with the great ideas. Uh, you've got uh, your, your third party folks, your uh, spin outs, uh, small companies, your big companies, your investors. And then you have the go between, which is the Office of Technology Licensing, Office of Technology Transfer, uh, what have you. The folks that help the inventors bridge the gap to get to market, to commercialize in the spin outs or with the bigger small companies or the investors. With regard to inventors specifically, um, I, I thought it was interesting a lot of the things that, that Vivek was saying uh, from a patent attorney's uh, standpoint. A lot of times you hear certain statements and the hair on the back of your neck goes up. Um, and and uh, to Lori's points as well, um, you know, I, I think the, the publish or perish concept has probably gone out the window, at least in my practice. I think most inventors at universities are pretty well versed in the fact that I can't go publish papers and then 10 years later try to get a bunch of patents on certain things and then you know, have OTL try to sell those patents and make something of them. Because you know, in the end, um, I'm going to be barred in the US and internationally. Uh, but having said that, there are a lot of nuances that go into what constitutes a publication. And one of the things I just want to throw out there, uh, because I had this conversation recently with an inventor we were working with, is anything that is going to be publicly available, even if it's handing out a slide presentation, and it could even be so simple as somebody taking notes when I give a slide presentation that I don't hand out. If I publicly disclose that information, I've got a one-year clock ticking in the United States. And internationally, as was said earlier, the clock, uh, the, the buzzer may have gone off. That, that may be it. And, uh, and the reason that I mention that is uh, I, I think folks have a tendency, uh, inventors and, and to some extent universities as well, and even those who commercialize uh, the technologies, the third party entities, uh, have a tendency to look at uh, market centric wherever the invention is located. Um, so by that I mean if we're at Princeton and we're inventing at Princeton, we look at the United States and that's the market that we're going to be focused on. One of the key issues though is as I try to commercialize a technology, I may find that my market's a little different. We had some folks recently that found that their seminal market was going to be China. Um, they were going to have a problem with this absolute novelty issue uh, because they had already published, although we were inside a year in the United States. and. Uh, the, the reason that was given why they weren't thinking of China to begin with is, well, enforcement is difficult in China. And while you may talk to, to patent attorneys or other folks who will tell you that that is often the case that different companies have, uh, countries have different enforcement mechanisms, uh, wherever is going to be the key market for the product or markets for the product, you want to make sure you have some protections there. Um, I've sat in, in meetings with folks that says, uh, you know, why do I need a patent? Well, in the end, um, I don't think it's a question of whether you need a patent. It's probably a question if you want to commercialize a technology of how thorough does your patent coverage have to be? And I may be one of the few patent attorneys in the world that will tell you my belief is it's an inverse proportion to the disruptive nature of the technology. Um, in my experience, the more disruptive, the more cutting edge, the more different, the more new a technology is, you want to protect yourself, but you want to leave available to the market areas around which to develop the technology because you want the market to create itself. If it's that new, there's probably not currently somebody selling anything really similar to it. Um, and and that, that inverse nature, I think often, you know, 
gets lost in let's this is a good idea and we think there's a market for it so let's patent the limit daylights out of it and it can stifle development and, and I think a, a fine example of this is Apple um, Apple at their inception um, they were a very closed company they were a closed universe they were a pretty closed operating system they were pretty closed-minded in general and they like to get lots and lots of intellectual property um, and I don't know about you folks, but I didn't hear much about Apple until probably seven, eight years ago, and now they're everywhere. And the reason that they're everywhere is they opened up. They started getting key patents on certain technologies, but they gave themselves broad coverage and left open the ability for the market to develop around them, the iPhone being a terrific example. They want people to go develop apps for the iPhone. They want people to get patents on those apps because those people will make money off those apps and then more people will want to do more apps. Apple had a great idea. I think the, uh, uh, the other avenue, uh, although they, they were not uh, stemming out of a uh, university, is Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm is nothing but a licensing company at this point. But uh, what Qualcomm did is they said, we have a highly, highly disruptive idea uh, code division multiple access technology uh, to communicate uh, by uh, cellular devices. And they said, we're going to get some patents on it. And they've got, I think to this day, they probably got about a thousand patents. But if you think about how long Qualcomm has been around and how integral Qualcomm has been to the development of, of an industry that's so key to everybody's lives nowadays, a thousand patents is not that much. And one of the reasons Qualcomm did that, they, they really went after their uh, the chip, their MSM chip that runs their phones, but they tried to leave a lot of the remaining universe open. They knew they'd become a licensing company ultimately and they'd license these technologies. They wanted people to develop around it. It's again creating a market. And, and the reason I give these examples is I think one of the keys uh, from an inventor's standpoint is, uh, and, and we work with a lot of inventors, there are great ideas and there are ideas that will sell and they're not always exactly the same thing. And with regard to the patent process, one of the things uh, that I would ask is, um, we certainly want the raw technology and usually coming out of the university, it's pretty raw. It's not ready to be commercialized, you know, two days after it's conceived of. Uh, however, even at a raw stage, uh, one of the, the keys is, what am I going to put in a box and sell? Or what variety of things can I put in a box and sell? And that leads me to the next step in the process, which is the Office of Technology Licensing. It will help in the patent process. Uh, and it, it, A, it will go more smoothly. And B, it will better enable uh, OTL to elect what inventions they're going to pursue. If they, they are given guidance as to how this will be commercialized, what will be put in a box and ultimately sold. Uh, and are there avenues that the inventor is already aware of by which we could commercialize this? Or are we talking about, uh, here's the market, here's the sector of the market that's really not served. That's the sector of the market. We're going to put something in the box and we're going to sell to that. And there's no company that does that or no company that would be interested in that. And we're probably looking at a spin-out uh, situation. Uh, OTL, and, and we discussed this previously, I mean, there's a lot of functions that go into the go-between realm between the inventors and the third parties. Uh, a lot of agreement work is involved. And you know there'll be contacts from the inventors, contacts from the university and OTL that will help those licenses come to be, that will further vet the technology and get it closer to commercialization. Uh, one of the key items with regard to intellectual property to keep an eye on at this stage is the inventor's continued participation is always key. It's always helpful as the product moves to market. Um, it varies university to university what the rules are for the inventor's involvement. Um, those have to be uh, carefully followed, and I think most universities are now broadening their horizons. They want the inventor to have skin uh, to continue in the game. Uh, you know, inventors uh, be able to be involved with technologies that spin out into new companies. Um, when that happens, um, usually the intellectual property portfolio will begin to burgeon. If the company spins out or it's looking at a potential acquirer uh, or it's looking to do a series of licenses, now the intellectual property becomes more key because we're not simply protecting the little niche in which we initially thought we were going to start. Now we're trying to protect the market. We're trying to protect the commercialized product. 
And the goals, when they change, the intellectual property has to change. While first uh, and foremost, protection in the United States may have been key. At this juncture, uh, as, as we move from the go-between area, the, the OTL, into the outside world, we may need things like foreign patent coverage, PCTs. We may have ongoing ideas where we're further developing the initial concepts. We'll make new US filings. Uh, it's not a stagnant thing as the process moves along and the inventor needs to be or the inventors need to be intimately involved throughout the process at the last stage of the process um, we've got as i said sort of this uh, uh, conglomerate of uh, you know big companies spin outs small companies investors they're all working together uh, uh, and and in many uh, deals in which i've been involved they truly do all work together there may, you, you may be getting monies or assistance from all of those parties. Um, a key issue at that juncture is, again, intellectual property. Um, the cooperative effort that has to occur between these different entities, and principally because no product, uh, or generally, no product's going to get to market without some help. There are going to be things along the way. You're going to need to acquire other technologies. Well, that means acquiring other intellectual properties or you yourself may be acquired by uh, another entity that is going to, to vary the technology or add things to it and take it to market. Uh, I was actually involved in a technology that came out of the University of California. Um, it was a, a pretty simple uh, technology that had to do with advertising and buying advertising over the internet for radio. Uh, that went through uh, assistance from an outside investor it spun out into its own small company. It went from the spin out stage into three other rounds of investment. It acquired four other companies and it was acquired three years ago by Google for over a billion dollars. Um, those, that's the way the raging successes happen and they are rare in my experience. Uh, you know, to the point made earlier, a lot of times breaking even isn't so bad. <laughs> but one of the things that, that I'd like to convey today is breaking even, uh, if the company is based on intellectual property, and, and while I do agree that, that when a company is acquired or invested in, it's the people that the investment is in. But what the people are going to use to commercialize is the intellectual property. Um, if you've got software, for example, people aren't buying the code. They could redesign the code themselves. But that's the entire reason why intellectual property is so key. And to the extent that you know the, the intellectual property has developed along with the company. Um, it, it allows for the company to, to continue to grow, to seek other acquisition targets. And in the end, uh, what we did with this particular example of the company with Google is, we knew six months into the process that we wanted Google to acquire this company. So the intellectual property gravitated towards Google and what it is Google would want to buy and what it is that they do. And that's what intellectual property can do for you. That's what patents can do for you. In the end, it is itself a saleable item. And to the extent you break even, that's actually pretty good, particularly in this economy. But the intellectual property is always worth something and it will very rarely be worth, uh, to the point earlier that lawyers don't take equity anymore. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, we asked for a couple bucks here and there, but in the end, the intellectual property that we're getting uh, is, is 99 times out of 100 gonna be at a minimum worth what was paid for it and generally will be worth more. I do a lot of work where I go to auctions. There's a big one out in San Francisco and I buy and sell intellectual property for folks. And uh, it astonishes me because a lot of these lots, they start at $75,000, $80,000, which those are the low end lots at these auctions. And you think, well, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm doing this wrong, but I don't charge $80,000 to do anything. Um, so if people are getting $80,000 out of these patents, um, you know, they're just the intellectual property itself is, is supportive enough of the business model that it's worth the investment. Thanks, Tom. Well, in order to uh, start these ventures based on new technology, we need some money. And uh, perhaps you can uh, tell us about uh, Jumpstart. Sure. Thanks again for sponsoring this, Kathleen. Um, well, we're moving into a new environment now. So we have the idea, we have the Office of Tech Transfer, we have some patents. And I'm just going to go over a few highlights because we're into an area where early stage angel investors in technology are very rare beings. 
They invest a lot in pre-revenue companies, which is tough to do. The statistics that Vivek mentioned about two out of 20 being alive, those are still real today. I mean, an average investor invests uh, in, in early stage investing hopes that they'll get a home run out of one out of 10 investments. You know, three may just sort of live and, and the other six may die, okay? So it's still, it's a very high risk, uh, but why do they do it? I mean, why do they want to do this? Um, and so we're gonna talk about, I'm talking a little bit about what they're looking for in the technology businesses. Um, how do you find investors? Because they're hard to find. What do they really want? And how do you develop a successful relationship with investors? Because that's really critical at an early stage. Um, tech transfer is really a key. And here at Princeton, you have, you have a great office that can actually one-on-one -on -one work with you. And in addition, I know we'll come back to it, but if you're a undergraduate, there are different rules for ownership of technology. So I know we'll talk about that a little bit. So the undergrads technology, if it's theirs alone and not part of a graduate discussion, and Lori will expand on this, becomes theirs. And so we've actually talked to some uh, um, undergraduates in the past as well as uh, uh, larger researchers. So what are early stage investors looking for? Uh, people are going back to this, in this issue of, in, uh, of intellectual property, the patent. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have anything else, you have some quality research, something that can move forward. So that's important to technology investors. And there are different kinds of patents. There are some that are really good. There are some that I would refer to as trash IP, that people have gotten a patent because they know people want to invest in a patent, but it's not really worth anything. It's not worth the process. And we have seen that for some, from businesses, not from, not from universities per se. So the investor wants innovative patented technology solving a real problem with a large market in a space with, where the investor has some expertise. Because people are not gonna come in and, and uh, at, at an angel stage and work with a company if they can't bring something more to the table than dollars. They may have connections in that space. They may have done this a model that they wanna to apply to that business before. They may be experts in defense department uh, procurement from other businesses and be able to bring it to the table. Um, they also, for angel investing, need a low level of efficient capital to bring the business to commercial fruition. Most angels do not invest in biotech. The length of time that Lori talked about for drug, I mean, I can't tell you the number of drug discovery plans that we get, we can't do those. The length of time is too long and the dollar amount needed to bring them to commercialization or even to an M&A exit are way too high for angel investors. They'll be wiped out at, at an early stage. Um, and they all, but they also want to have a research leader, the person who's found this discovery or part of the team who communicates the value and knowledge uh, and is an enthusiastic representative. Now that person may, may or may not be involved uh, with the company, it depends upon what their interests are, uh, because a lot of university professors are not leaving the university or they might be a graduate student who comes out with a team and helps with, with the startup of a business. So someone who really understands the technology and who's enthusiastic about it. Um, so, I mean, that's like the holy grail of any kind of investment, you know, great technology, good team, um, something that has value. But the risk is still so high at this stage. I mean, there's no revenue. You're not really sure, and to use the phrase of one of my angel investors, you're not sure if the dog will eat the dog food. Is there pain? Will somebody really like this product? So that's, that's still really critical. Um, so how do you find investors? How do you find who uh, you should be talking to? Tech transfer again first. They, they talk to everybody. People come to them and say, I'm interested in this particular space. Who should I be talking to at the university? They know the patents that are here. Some universities uh, take all of their patents and have them online for people to look at. Um, I don't think Princeton does that, but I do know that uh, Rutgers does it. Um, there's also now in the state of New Jersey something called a patent bank, which the state has said anybody who has a patent can put it up here and people can view it, search it, and look at it. And that's been in the last uh, nine months or so. Um, the local technology business community. Okay, people who are doing investing in technology. There's tech. There's the New Jersey Technology um, uh, Council. Uh, their bio events in Pennsylvania has lots of events. Uh, there's uh, and and like New Jersey, we work sort of in this uh, Connecticut to Virginia area. Angels work within sort of a half day's drive of where they can be. 
So it doesn't matter that it's New Jersey or it's local, it matters what the technology is. And so they look at everything. Um, strategic company partners, which Lori and Tom have talked about. University department advisory boards. There's a lot of talent on each of these departments that they have who have connections to uh, different parts of the industries. Um, certainly angel investors, which who are all quirky, okay? I have no, no problem describing them as quirky. Uh, everybody has their own space that they're interested in. Um, legal and accounting referrals are really important too. Tom will talk to people who are inventing things. Uh, his commercial partners will say, we have an early startup business, we want you, and they can introduce to early stage investors or connections at uh, large corporations. And there's regional venture fairs too, which are great educational pieces. So you can see how people present a business and some of its early stage and get an education there from a different sort. And they happen here in New Jersey and Pennsylvania quite often. Um, angels want to see the tech, your intellectual property cleared by the tech transfer office. We do not want anybody to disclose something that voids a patent application. That's really critical. So, and when we have these innovation forums in the spring, one of the important things is having tech transfer do a uh, uh, sort of a wave off on the information because you don't want to, you know, to hurt yourself. And we certainly don't want to see that as investors. Uh, the other thing they want to see is we, we, begin, we, get, we begin to start talking a different language. Okay, I don't know what, I don't want to know how many mouse studies have gone into this. I want to know you have a drug or a molecule that does X, and I want you to say it to me. I don't want you to say, I don't want you to do a chemical description. It. I don't want you to d describe how you got there plank by plank. I want you to say, I have this bridge and it does X. And that's really important because we're talking different languages now. The investment, the investors will come back and say, okay, you told me you have this, and if I really like this idea, I'll do due diligence and find out if it's there. But usually in a scientific presentation, you talk about the steps you got to get to the decision at the end. So we sort of reverse a lot of our, our discussions. Um, also, too, we want you to know what's out there in the competitive environment that, uh, that there's more than that you may be aware of. And that's important for the researchers to know, too. Uh, the enthusiasm for you and your, and your research and your products is the thing that's going to get it in front of investor. I mean, tech transfer can only do so much. But if you're not out there talking to people or making them aware of this, there's not, there's not enough feet on the street, I think, for that to happen. Um, and I think that's sufficient to start a dialogue with investors. So you're really clear about what you have, what the benefits are, and, uh, and sort of what you want to do. Um, and then we get down to actually dealing with investors. And the basics of a good relationship are, are very simple, but we do have a big disconnect between university behavior and investor behavior. And um, all they're asking for is, you met somebody, you say I want to get funding, and you don't return their telephone call, okay? And, you don't, and then you might return the telephone call two months later, <laughs> all right? And in the meantime, they've gone to tech transfer and said, I talked to this person, they said they were interested, but you know, what's going on? You know, it, and then tech transfer will go say, well, they're, you know, they're finishing. <laughs> Their, uh, their PhD or something's going on, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it, it, it's this really the truth of it. So you sort of have to, you have to be big people in the sense that you return the phone call and say, I'm too busy right now, I'm grading papers, I can't talk for two months, okay? Whatever it is, you've got to have some kind of connection with the individuals. And I'm not just being random about this. This is like multiple examples of this all throughout universities. Uh, people saying, yes, I really want to talk to you. Or, and, I, and I know one of our investors, when he deals with university, um, uh, individuals says, here is my card. And let me tell you, that's very rare to be able to get an investor's card. So if you have that, that's very important. Here's my card. You call me when you're ready to talk. Okay. And either they will or they won't, but he's not going to worry about it. And if they haven't called him in a certain period of time, he's on to other projects. And that's the issue because we really are in sort of like business time. So if people don't hear from you, they've got lots of things to look at. Um, and the other thing, and the other thing too, the investor expects you to be able to distill the value and benefit of your innovation, and be able to communicate that well. So, you've gotten patent, you've talked to some investors, and I think the, the the other big question is, are you really ready for investors? Do you really know what you want to do? 
And that's important too, especially if there's, there's somebody coming out of the university to a business, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it's a straight licensing. Sometimes it's work that's being done in the university and, and, and funded. Um, but I think you need to start familiarizing yourself with business valuations, with market terms. Talk to people who've done this before. Vivek was saying this. There's a lot of great resources. You need to have a lot of assistance. It is a team sport. And the more you know um, and the more you can and figure out a path for yourself, I think it makes for a successful relationship with investors. Because investors are going to put their money in uh, into a business. They're going to want a piece of equity for that, and they're going to be and they're going to have a development path that may be different from what you are interested in. So that's just sort of a thumbnail, quick sketch about early stage investors and um, and some relationships with them. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Well, you're one of those courageous guys that makes early stage investments in life sciences. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Should I speak on the speaker? Yeah, here. Well, thank you for having me. So my colleagues here covered a lot of good grounds. Um, I guess what I'm going to talk about um, is uh, from a perspective of a person who's been on both sides of the table. So about 10 years ago, after a career in R&D, I uh, ended up being the founding CEO of a medical device company and trying to raise money between 2001 and 2000, 2003, which was just as difficult as it is probably today. Um, made dozens of investor presentations to dozens of investors and VCs, and um, long story short, we raised money, got FD approval, the company was taken over. And, uh, and today I sit on the other side of the table as an investor, try to make decisions of you know, what technology really can make money and be successful. Um, and, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I, I work as a, at a firm called BioAdvance, so I like to say a few things about BioAdvance. Uh, BioAdvance was established in uh, 2002 out of the uh, uh, tobacco settlement money out of the state of uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we started with uh, a fund of about $20 million. It's a green um, greenhouse fund, and what that means is that our, our returns, our proceedings, our profit goes back into the fund and get reinvested. Uh, so it's very unique with, re with that respect. <coughs> in eight years, we've invested in 26 companies. Uh, six of them have, uh, have successfully been exited and, and, and purchased. Um, we've had two failures and 18 active companies that we manage. And we make uh, a couple investments per year. Uh, anywhere between about a half a million dollar to about 1.2 million dollars, primarily in human health. Um, that is uh, drugs, devices, diagnostics, uh, anything involved in human health. Um, and um, um, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, now, um, I will go through a number of things, pitfalls or, or questions, key questions that we look for when we try to invest in a company. but you know, before I get there, I think the most important thing I need to cover is that where we come in in the, in the continuum of funding is where we like to be between R&D, uh, academic um, research uh, work, and more of a uh, Series A or a, a large VC comes in and invests in a company. So we try to cover that gap to make sure that the uh, technologies out of universities do make it to uh, do have a chance to be commercialized. And I think that's the most important thing for us. And there's a gap there. There's a gap that, that, that is anywhere between two to five million dollars, depending on the technology and on the work. So to, to bring the technology many, very often from, from a university to where a large investor invests in it requires some, some work, and that's where we come in. So we want to make sure that our money and that our investment covers the gap. Um, or at least, uh, you know, a good part of it, so that there is there is someone on the other end. And and even though we invest in human health, uh, most investors in this economy look for investment opportunities that have a finite amount, that need a finite amount of cash uh, to move forward. And I think that's very important. So you have to always keep that in mind. How much money do you need to move this to the next inflection point in value um, at, at any time? But let's talk about uh, what I like to call, uh, call um, you know, key questions or, 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 or common pitfalls. The, the process of raising money is about removing barriers, right? So you want to remove barriers so an investor gets excited and interested in your technology and invest. And I'm going to go through 
a number of them very quickly, and you know, we'll have time to talk about it afterward. Um, I guess the first thing I want to cover is, is that um, um, a, lot of, a lot of times we see things that are, they have insufficient scientific or technical foundation. In other words, there is additional you know, basic research that needs to get done before uh, the technology is, is improved. So, so that's one of the common pitfalls that, that you want to make sure that you, uh, you cover. Uh, the next thing that we see very often is a solution looking for a problem. And, and what we call is that, you know, even if you can do what you say you're going to do, would anybody care? In other words, is there a market for it? Is there a customer that's going to buy it and pay for it? Now, this may sound like a cliche, but if you get to the bottom of it, I think it's, it's tough to, to, to address a lot of these things. Um, the, the next thing is that, you know, is the development plan is feasible? Now, when I was trying to raise money 10 years ago, a lot of the investors were questioning me on my every step of development plan for the next three years. Can you do this? Do you have the people to do this? Do you know what it takes? Do you, do you have regulatory people? Do you have the right you know, patent attorneys? Do you have the right people involved? Do, you, do you, your people have the right connections? I think that's very important. Now, development plans change all the time, but you have to have the whole solution before you go to an investor. <clears throat> Um, do you have the right, you know, commercial strategy? You know, do you, do you know who you're going to sell this to? How are you going to sell it? Um, the next idea is that, you know, great idea about um, how can you stop others from doing it? And I think this is where my colleague talked about IP. It's either IP or something else. So you may have a great idea, but it's got to be protectable. It's got to be unique. And in our case, specifically in human health, um, we do look for worldwide rights. So, so if you want to invest in, in like a drug and you only, if you only have, um, you know, U.S. Um, intellectual property rights, uh, that is a, that's a very negative point for us just because of the economy, you know, the economy of it. Um, the next thing is a management team. Um, it all comes down to execution and, and the folks that are around the table and the management team. We look for three things and I like to put it very simply. We look for folks that are, um, that are effective, that means they, they can do the right thing. They're, uh, they're efficient, they can do that in the right way and that we can work with. So, so I think it's important to have those three. And, um, and um, the next thing is, you know, a lot of folks uh, come to us with all these things answered, but they can't really get there from where we are. That needs, that needs way too much money, uh, it requires a lot more effort. And, uh, and if you can see, like I said at the beginning, that we cannot cross this gap, that our money is not going to be enough to take them to the next inflection point, to the next investor, to the next acquirer, then we won't invest because it just leaves them out with nothing. Even if they do what they're going to say they're going to do, even if they're successful, they'll be out in the cold and we lose our money. And the last point is probably the most important of all, and this is a, a practice and just yeah, mathematics is that the reward um, has to justify the risk. You know, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, if you say that the investor has to make three times its investment, and um, if you, you, you can sort of predict how much money the company is going to require to get to a point where it can get acquired, well, then you're going you're to be able to sell it three times that, right? So if you come to us and say, you know, my company is going to take, you know, $10 million to be at a point where it can prove itself and get acquired, well, we would like that company to be acquired about $30 million. If that's reasonable, then we'll invest. But, you know, we often have people that come to us and they say, you know, it's going to probably acquire $100 million before it gets to a point where, where it can get acquired. But, you know, it's going to be big, big. Well, you know, can you, can you sell it at $300 million? And how many are there out there? Show us comparables. And there's not. Sometimes, you know, you'll see a blank face. Well, you know, we can't, we can't show you any company that's been acquired in this space for $300 million. Well, that's, you know, it's not going to, you know, it's not, we're not going to invest in that. So, um, you know, investors invest for only one reason, and this is sort of that I realize is, is the one reason is to make money. That's it. It's the only reason investors invest for money. And you have to be able to do the math and to make sure that the money that's required to get you there makes sense. Um, so um, those are all the ones I wanted to cover. Thank you. Thanks so much. Any, any questions? Uh, we have uh, microphones. That, uh, so if you have a question, and raise your hand, and, and a microphone will be brought to you. 
and then you can uh, ask your question either to the whole panel or to uh, uh, specific members of the the panel. I need to get the mic back here real quick. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did they hide them? Yeah, they hid them. It's a small enough room. Oh. We may just have Why to don't you ask your question? You're up close. So, around. Speakers move their mics up so we can really use the mics. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we can do that, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. I don't know how far they'll go, but sure. For the speaker, repeat the question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Takes long. Here we go. Okay. I think he's going to ask questions. Thank you. So you spoke about management. Can you describe what you, you know, the functional team, what it might look like for a type of college spinoff? You know? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, actually, um, I talked about management. I did not talk about uh, CEO. I did not talk about functional point. Uh, you know, we, when, when, when the technology comes out of the university, we don't actually expect it to have a complete management. We don't expect them to have a CEO or CFO or anything like that. What we like is an owner of the technology, someone who is able to um, stand behind the technology and execute the plan. That could be an operational person, someone who understands the technology and knows what need, needs to do to get it to the next step. Um, so from that perspective, uh, you know, it's someone who is dedicated, who has a history of you know, success, um, and, and like I said, um, knows what needs to get done and can do it right and we can work with. Those are very broad uh, comments. Um, we don't expect necessarily a serial entrepreneur. We don't expect uh, the person to come in saying, you know, I'm going to be the CEO or do all that. But we actually have a lot of folks in our network uh, that, that can fill those positions or fill those responsibilities or help along or coach. So that's not needed, but, but we do need a champion, someone that's going to say, you know, I'm going to take this. Not, not that I'm aware. Um, so every, everything that, that has ever been concocted by a Princeton faculty member has by definition been shepherded through the process by your office or some more or less than others. Yeah, well, I think there, there's maybe the way I look at it is two, two different ways. There's companies out there who want to license our technology. And they, and they may be companies with a management team that are focused in a certain area, like say like oncology, and they have a relationship with one of our PIs and they are sort of repeat licensees of ours. So they see they license one portfolio and they they have a you know an ongoing relationship with the PI and he shares with them what he's doing and the invention disclosure comes to our office and the next day that company is calling our office asking about it. Um, so I, I you know and then a lot of times we have PIs that want to start a technology over a disclosure that they've sent to our office. Very few of our faculty actually leave to do startups themselves. We usually find people to help them create that startup and move and move on. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but uh, okay, thank you. Okay, that's in our patent policy, which is published, but up to the first 100000 and that is less our out-of-pocket costs. So our salaries, uh, the operation of the office does not come out of that. It's actually the out-of-pocket, usually patent expenses, <laughs> that come out. So the, up to the first hundred, it's 50% to the inventor. To, uh, between 100 and 400, it's, it's uh, 40%. And then after 400, it's um, 30%. And then the, the difference is the, the um, up to 
this the um, with the forty percent the department of the PI gets ten percent, and then with the thirty percent the department gets twenty percent up to a million. Hi, uh, Yaping from Computer Science Department. I have a question that um, ideas are really cheap these days, and the project we have in university is pretty different from the product. So what's the thorough process to go through in order to design the compelling strategy to win over the competitors, and how can you evaluate that? Thank you. Well, I think if, if I understood the question that you want to know how to bring maybe uh, uh, something you're working on to a uh, to an invention or to a product and I would say the first thing is to fill out an invention disclosure and, and send it to our office because in that invention disclosure the other questions that I mentioned uh, earlier we'll ask what what the unmet need is we'll ask what your what your dreams are for the technology what your ideas are you know, how it, you know, what's the state of the art, how it's better than the state of the art, what the limitations may be, and we can help you, um, you know, with that process. Maybe it's something that needs to incubate a little bit more. Uh, maybe you have to publish on it, and we can give you the guidance of how to, you know, sort of have the best of both worlds. And I'd be happy to, you know, send you a form if you give me your card or, you know. If I could just follow on to that, one of the key items in the patent process is that, uh, uh, actual reduction to practice isn't necessary. So when you pursue patent coverage, it doesn't have to be on the things that you're, you've done or reduced to practice. A uh, patent application, if enabled, is itself a constructive reduction to practice, meaning if I've already done something and I can see that, you know, once I modify it in a couple different ways, it will be applicable to this and this and this, I can build all that into a patent application by just giving the underlying thing I've already done and saying it's applicable to do this, and to do this, and to do this. Okay, this is probably a different sort of question. Uh, concerning liability, um, for example, we know lots of times there are products that uh, that don't work the way they're supposed to work or they have some really bad side effects, defective car brakes, accelerators that get stuck, uh, drugs that cause very, very serious effects. Um, this is well known. Okay, so my question is, uh, would liability fall only on the company or companies which manufacture products which are proven to have these faulty uh, side effects or could liability sometimes fall on an inventor or organization that's involved uh, at the beginning or midway? Turns out that, oh, this was a really bad idea, you know. And of course, companies were interested because they would make money on it. As an example, um, for example, suppose, a, suppose an inventor had an idea, oh, uh, gee, I think I can come up with a product which will make uh, which will solve the obesity problem, okay? It'll be an anti-obesity drug. People won't have to exercise to stay s slim. It will even uh, solve the problem of kids being fidgety in class. They can take this drug and they won't be fidgety in class and they can be, be, you know, pay better attention. But it turns out that these drugs have some really serious side effects. Okay, who's going to be liable for the bad effects? I guess that's your question, Thomas. Let the lawyer handle it. <laughs> um, in, in a nutshell, I think the answer to that is it's exceedingly unlikely that the inventor would be liable for anything. Um, the only circumstance I can think of where the inventor might have some liability is if the inventor knew all of that to be true, how dangerous it was, and intentionally concealed it um, in order to, to get royalty payments or what have you. And if that could be proven, even if that's a stretch, but if that could be proven, then maybe you'd have some minimal liability to the inventor. Yeah, and I would add in our license agreements, we have particular clauses so that the university or the inventor are not liable. I mean, we, we, we have those things. Kind of like the tobacco industry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm a postdoc against the customs, uh, and I was curious if there is this actual property 
created outside of the university and is part of it. Could the university be helpful in commercializing it or not? Like process of technology licensing? I'm sorry, you said outside of the university? Maybe you could repeat your question. I didn't hear. Uh, can your office be helpful in commercializing it? You know, we, we would be happy to talk to you and, and offer assistance, but uh, as far as um, actually supporting, I mean, funding that intellectual property, that, that I don't think would be possible, but we'd be certainly happy to, you know, share our contacts with you and help in any way that we could. Sure. I have a question for Catherine. Um, we talk a lot about intellectual property, but uh, I would like to hear from you from the AG Investor Network. Uh, how important is, is it to have solid or rock solid IP uh, for you and, and, and your group to, to, to actually consider investing? Um, I mean, it depends. Um, the IP, or sometimes it's a, it could be just a, a work process, not even not even patented. Um, if it's something unique that can be replicated, that it's a key to the core of this business that nobody else has, I mean, that's why people go after IP. Um, I am not the specialist in IP. We have a couple of our members who can read a patent like there's nobody's business. Because the other issue, too, is that you can have patents, but do you have freedom to operate? And freedom to operate is far more important than the patent. And you heard me make a reference to trash patents. There's a lot of uh, computer science businesses these days which are really, um, they'll have patented applications, but they're not necessarily key to the business and it's not important to it, but they'll have them because they've been told they're not gonna get an investment unless they have IP. So you, I, I, I sort of uh, you know, equivocate on this answer, so. It depends, depends on how unique it is, depends on what your product is and what it solves. So you don't need to actually have any IP for you to invest? No, but I don't want to see another social networking side either, okay? <laughs> 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 Which has no IP, all right? You know, there's, no, there's nothing there. Everyone, everyone and their brother has put one up lately and, or, or believes they have another unique site for that, okay? So that's why we, that's why we would like something. I will, I will exercise the prerogative of the chair to ask the last question because I know there's a reception and people may have other things to go to. We've talked about uh, inventors on the university faculty and, and staff. We've talked about investors and uh, talked about the IP. What if someone in this audience is an entrepreneur I don't have an idea, but if I had an idea, I think I could make it happen because I've started companies in the past. Is there some process for entrepreneurs to approach the university and, and then be part of this process even though they aren't the inventors or associated or maybe even knowledgeable uh, beforehand in, of the t technologies that are available? And if so, has that happened? in the past where the university gets approached by someone and they find something and then work with investors to create a company? Yeah, I, I would, I would um, give you an example where um, there was a group actually from the UK coming in looking for early stage technology. And through a contact of mine, um, she recommended that they come up to Princeton. They were doing some business in the Philadelphia area with universities and they, they were in the area and it's only a 45 minute drive. And I said, sure, we'd love to have you know, them stop by. So we, we uh, arranged for them to come to Princeton and meet in, with our office and you know, just understanding their areas of interest. You know, everyone's got a specific area of interest if it's devices and, and, and what particular area. And we did find a, a technology that they, that they latched onto and were in discussions and um, you know, hope things move on from there. But it, it doesn't happen overnight, but you know, we're always very happy and it happens a lot that people are coming through the area, something brings them to the East Coast and they wanna stop and, and you know, the best thing to do is to email us and you know, come and talk to us. Yeah. Kathleen, do some of your angel investors take an active role like this of identifying opportunities rather than um, just investing in something someone else has started? 
Absolutely, and several have been visitors to uh, yeah. Lori uh, and to find they're interested in certain information and she gets them in contact with those investigators. And it just depends on, on the angel investor. Some people like an early, <clears throat> early stage where they can add a lot of value. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they do, and they'll also go to other universities and, and look at, at, at technology there. Um, but not all investors do that, but uh, several of them have made the trip to uh, Lori's office and, and, and know her well. And John, does your, your firm do this, yes, where you absolutely. actually start the company? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we have relationship with uh, most, if not all, the universities in the area within the Philadelphia and also within New Jersey, in Rutgers, Princeton. Um, part of our job is to source technologies, find technologies, um, uh, or companies that are that are about to be spun off, mm -hmm. and, um, and and we do that actively. We have workshops, so we have entrepreneurial workshop within the Philadelphia region where we spend an hour or two talking to entrepreneurs or potential um, researchers who want to do something, and, and that's on our calendar on buyadvance.com. So we do a lot of the outreach. Uh, well, that's the last question. I want to thank all of the panelists for a, a very. Uh, Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society.